Okay, here we go. Welcome. Um, we are here for Can Your Preschooler Learn Chess with Chess for Life. Paul Faraka is here with us. Hi. I am Katie Warren with the Head Start ECAP Association and Joel, our Executive Director, is here as well. We have been partnering with Chess for Life for um, a couple of years to do a curriculum for chess in early learning classrooms. It is super cute to see three-year-olds playing chess or their version of chess uh -huh. and they have we've really been tracking how they've been learning both in terms of their um, social uh, their their math skills and spatial skills but also social emotional development there's a lot of ritual and turn taking and things around chess um, and these are things that your parents can do at home as well with their kiddos so um, Joel, do you have anything to add before we turn it over to Paul? No, I think you covered it. I'm excited. Um, thank you. We got some new people on um, today to learn about whether preschoolers can learn chess. And as we say on all of these, yes, they can. They absolutely can. Learn play <laughs> you really spoiled and, the surprise, uh, Joel. <laughs> I know, I know. I always step on our applause line, but um, but yes they absolutely can learn to play chess and it it's so good to develop those cognitive and math and social emotional skills that will serve them very really well in the elementary school years and so this is our third um lesson uh zoom video lesson that uh, paul has been doing so i'm just going to turn it over to paul and um he'll give you some really simple things you can do to uh, to start launching your chess master at yes. home or in your classroom <laughs> Thanks, Joel. Thanks, Katie. Yep. So uh, right before we dive into the activity, I actually just want to check with you three. So I found out that the, who we have on the call are new today, but could you also, um, there's some Zoom tools that we might use. So if you see at the bottom of your Zoom window, there's a participants button. If you click that, it should open you, open up another window that has a list of people and you'll see a raise hand, a yes icon, a no icon. Could you go ahead and just click a yes or no um, if you have any experience playing chess? So hit yes if you have some, you, you know the rules. Hit no if you're just like, I've never played a game before and just interested in uh, how you teach it to preschoolers, okay? Got a couple responses there. Great. And then could you also, there's a chat button uh, next to that participants button. Could you click that and just let me know, are you joining as a educator, as a parent? What's your, uh, what's your um, role you're kind of joining us today that you're hoping to, to then utilize chess with a, with a student or with your child? So there should be a chat box that you can do a chat to everyone. Just type in, you know, parent or teacher or where you, yeah. So we have a lead teacher from ECAP, awesome. Our teacher, great. Okay, so what I'm gonna do today is we're gonna go into, I'll do a little review on what we covered on the previous two webinars, because it will help uh, give you a good idea of how to do and what we're gonna do for the activity today. And just so you know, I've said it in the other webinars, so if you haven't seen these recordings or if this is your first time, the whole goal here is not to build Chess, little chess masters uh, is not to, you know, do this intense program where we have three, four, and five year olds learning all the rules of chess, playing full games with each other. Um, you know, that sounds really stressful. The goal is to use the game of chess and really simple, fun activities to help build kindergarten readiness. So, Katie talked about this a little bit in the intro. You know, we're building basic math, so there's a lot of counting involved. And you'll see when I pull up the chessboard, there's letters and numbers on it, there's patterns, and there is a lot of um, social emotional benefits they gain from playing chess. So a lot of our activities are actually teamwork activities. We don't do a lot of versus activities, you know, me versus you. The one I'm gonna show you today is one of those, but you'll see how simple it is. The two I'm gonna uh, show you that we did last few weeks are more we're working together to solve a problem. And then, you know, when we get back out of this kind of crisis time into the classroom, there's a lot of, you know, you shake hands before and after the chess game, you say, good job, thanks for playing. So we really help build those social emotional skills with the kids. 
So let me share my screen here. And so you all should be able to see uh, a chessboard on my screen, yes? Thumbs up or not, great. So the other previous classes, I actually had my camera pointed down at a physical chessboard. And I think it was cool to be able to see that board and the physical pieces, but um, this digital chessboard is just much easier to, to use in this kind of context. So uh, bear with me, I'm gonna use this, I'm gonna try using this digital chessboard today. And so I know it's kind of small here. Let me, um, let me show you something here really quick. So I'm gonna unzoom this in a sec, but you can see here that there are letters along the bottom of the chessboard, A through H, and numbers on the side, one through eight. So if your chessboard at home doesn't have these letters and numbers, you can always get a piece of masking tape and you know, tape it along the sides and write you know, A through H and one through eight on your chessboard. And the way you know you have your chessboard oriented correctly when you have these letters and numbers is a simple tool I like to use is ABC facing me. So if you're sitting at the chessboard with your student or you have two kids sitting there, the ABC, the letters should be facing you on the bottom of the chessboard and potentially on the other side of the chessboard if you, for the person on the other side. And then the numbers should be along the side. The other way you can test to see if you have it right is if you take your right hand and you put it in the bottom right hand square, it should be light. So your right hand on light, right on light. Okay, so let me go back to like the normal view here because that's a bit zoomed in. So I know the numbers and letters are much smaller, but that's, that should be fine. So the first webinar, we talked about where the pawns go. And the pawns are just the, is just the smallest piece in the chessboard. I can even get out a picture of a pawn here. So here's my pawn. You can see here, compared to the queen, right? The pawn is the, gonna be the shortest piece in the, in the group. So we have the kids find the shortest piece, the smallest piece, and the dark ones line up on the seventh rank or the seventh row. So you see there's a little number seven there. And the light ones line up on the second. So our very simple activity that we did to start this webinar series off was just talk about where the pawns go. They all have their own special spot in the chessboard. The light ones go on the number two and the dark ones go on the number seven. And then we have the kids count them. How many pawns do you have? How many light, how many dark, how many all together? Great, we have 16. So you can see here, we're starting to build in these basic counting skills, uh, letter and number identification, uh, following directions and spatial relationships. The pawns go in the squares and they form a line. So that's just one simple activity. And then the, how we gamify it in the end is we do a pawn setup race. So we have the kids push all the pawns into the middle of the board. And it's not me versus you who can set up their pawns fast, faster. It's us versus the clock. So we get a timer out on our phone and we hit go. And then the kids work together to set up their pawns in the proper squares. And if you finish first, you can help your partner. And so now it becomes a teamwork game. And the kids have a ton of fun with this. They don't need to know anything about the rules of chess, about how the pieces move to start having fun on their very first activity. Then what we talked about was the king. So I'll put the king here. The king is the tallest piece and he has a cross or plus on his head. Here's the dark king. So he's the tallest piece in the, in the set. And we talked about how the king moves one square in any direction. And for this activity, we have the kids partner up and they get a practice moving the king. We say, all right, where do you wanna move the king? Do you wanna to go to an edge? Do you wanna to go to the corner? And the kids say, all right, let's go to the corner. And so we count how many moves it takes the king to get to the corner. So I get to take a move and then my partner makes a move. And then I get to make a move and my partner gets to make a move. And we can count how many moves it takes to get to the corner. And they're just practicing with each other moving the king. Once they got that, we add a pawn to the chessboard as a target square. And so you can see how we're slowly building in these activities. And now the kids work together to go get that pawn. All right, let's see how many moves it takes to get there. One, two, three, four, five, six. Great, we did it in six moves. And then whoever lands on the pawn gets to pick it up and put it in a new square. 
as the kids get this activity, we can add more pawns to the chessboard and they can work on going and collecting them all. So those are the two activities that we covered in the uh, first webinar. In the second webinar, we actually then got into how the pawns move. Does anybody on this webinar know how the pawn moves? You can either chat it or you can unmute your microphone. No. No, it's OK. All right, so very simple. The pawn moves one square, oops, one square forward. So on my digital chessboard here, these dark pawns are coming down this way and the light pawns are going up the board. So the pawns just move one square forward. Now there's a special rule in chess as you get into uh, older kids where on the very first turn pawns could go two squares, but we leave that out with the young kids. We don't need to complicate it any further. So we just say the pawn moves one square forward. And so they practice moving their pawns, taking turns again, moving one square forward. And they can count the moves as they go, right? And then as they get towards the middle, they're like, uh-oh, they're all stuck. And we like to say the pawns <laughs> meet each other and they, they stop and have a talk. And so all these pawns are actually stuck and they can't move any further. This is also a fun game to do with the kids in, in with big motor movement. You can have them stand on a carpet and take one step forward towards each other. And when they meet, they can say hi and shake hands. Uh, obviously, <laughs> we're not doing that right now in this current time. But when we get back to some normalcy, those are great activities we can do with the students. And then we talk about, OK, the pawns are stuck, so what can they do? Well, pawns capture diagonally. So this light pawn can move diagonal and take the other pawn. And the kids start learning new vocabulary words like diagonal. And it's really fun to hear a four-year-old try to pronounce the word diagonal. <laughs> but they do, and they work on it, and they start using that chess language. And it's so exciting. And this dark pawn can move diagonally and capture this light pawn. And now once they've captured and there's nobody in front of them, they can keep moving along the chessboard and how they were previously. And the goal is to get to the other side. So today, the activity I'm gonna do is gonna be combining those elements, the pawns and the kings. So before I jump into that, is there anybody have any questions so far? I, I kind of got through that a little bit fast. I don't wanna overwhelm you. So I was trying to cover a little wrap up of the first two webinars. So feel free, any questions? It doesn't have to be just about these activities, anything that's coming to mind so far? Okay, great. Okay, so the way now that we combine those activities, so we build in kind of progressively a little bit more complexity to the activities, but still very simple. This next activity is now one team gets the pawns and they can place three pawns anywhere they want on the pawn starting row. So remember, does anybody remember the number that the pawns, the dark pawns start on? You can chat it or you can unmute. Dark pawns, okay, I see Rebecca hold up seven with her fingers. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, dark pawns start on number seven. So the player with the dark pawns can place three pawns anywhere they want. So now we're giving the kids a little bit of control so they can say, oh, I want my pawns over here. I want them all together or I want them really spread out and that's fine, whatever they want. And the other person gets one king of the opposite color. And they can place that king anywhere they want along this bottom row. So wherever they want, they could try to put it right in front of one of these pawns, or they could try to go in the middle. And now the goal is this king's job is he's going to try to go capture all of these pawns, or as many as he can. Okay, And the pawn's goal is to see if they can get to the other side of the chessboard <laughs> before being captured. So the way we do this is the king gets to move first and they get to take, remember, one square in any direction. So the king has five choices. So if a kid's thinking like, okay, I wanna go get this pawn right here, right in front of me, I'm gonna move right at it. And now the dark pawns get to make a move and maybe they're gonna move a pawn on the side one square. And the king's going to keep going forward, and the pawns can keep moving. 
and the student get, that plays the dark pawns gets to move whatever pawn they want, one square at a time. And they keep moving, and then this king captures that pawn. Okay, great, they got a pawn. And this one might keep working. And the king can move over. And this pawn could go, and the king can move over. And great, the dark team, they got a pawn across the other side. And now the king's still coming, the pawn's gonna move. Oh, the king got it. Okay, so great. How many pawns did the king get? Two, awesome, all right. How many pawns did you get across the board? One, good job. All right, let's try this again, but now let's give the dark team some more pawns. So they started with three, now, now we can give them five. And again, they can put them anywhere they want. And we'll do this activity again. And now the team with the dark pawns has a few more chances of getting more pawns across. And the king also has a few more chances of capturing more pawns. So we get to play through that game. And then once they got that down, we can add all the pawns. So you see how with these chess activities, we're not trying to overwhelm them with, all right, let's get all the pieces out. Let's play a, try to play a full game of chess. We're using these really simple, short, fun activities to help reinforce those math skills, those social emotional, and really the executive functioning skills for kids. So they have to recall, hey, how does the king move? Oh yeah, one square. Oh, how does the pawn move? One square forward, great. And they have to follow directions. And they also have to be uh, slightly flexible to changing plans, right? So maybe they were going for one pawn originally and then realize, oh, I'm not gonna be able to capture that one. I have to change my path and go a different way. So all those skills are so essential for these little kids, these little ones to build as they get ready for kindergarten. And if you're helping lead this for your students or your children, you know, you can change the difficulty level, right? You can get, you can say, let's just start with two pawns. Let's just start with one. Um, you know, if your kids are getting it and they're, you can add more. So you don't have to do the three, five, eight. You can use as many or as few pawns as you want. Now it's always good to let the kids have a chance playing from the other side too. So after you do this a few times and let one student with the king go after the pawns, it's always great to say, okay, now we're gonna switch sides. All right, if you were using the king, now you get to use the pawns instead. And so it gives kids a chance to play from these two different sides and practice these two different skills. Uh, are there any questions so far? Do you all see how this is helping really build those kindergarten readiness skills? Mm -hmm. uh, it would be great to hear too from you. Do you see any other um, applications of this or what could you see doing this in your classroom? Could you see doing this with your kids at home? What, what challenges do you think you might face? Well, we have a, we have a few comments on the chat. We have, this is great. The kids will love this game from uh, Rebecca. Michelle wrote, nope, looks so fun, cool. I would play. So that's, <laughs> awesome. That's good. Do you guys want to unmute yourself and just kind of say, talk a little bit about how, you know, could you implement this into your Head Start or ECAP classroom or at home, you know, and how do, how do you think this would work? One of the reasons that I um, chose to, to do this little Thing today is because I had a parent bring in an old chessboard that they weren't no, no, no. hearing anymore. you that well. Sorry. Just, like, you sorry, sorry, Michelle. You're, hey, uh, would your kids your mic's know, really good. You use this in class? And then I was like, yeah, I know some of the rules of chess. And chess and Sorry, Michelle, you sounded, you sounded like a robot there with yeah, the, the mic was not working properly. I think I think all I caught was somebody brought yeah, in the chessboard. I think I heard it on my last webinar. I'm going to need one of those like mouth pieces or something. Right. I'll type it. Hold on. Okay. Okay. I'll read it for it for Paul. It says the parents brought one in and the kids showed so much interest that's great that's um, good, yeah uh she wrote it was hard to teach yes. for the whole the the whole game yeah I, yeah so how, our, how much time do you do you recommend paul like how long how long should somebody stick with this before the kids you know start losing attention or you know, how, how, yeah. how much 
our our lessons and what we really recommend is 10 to 15 minutes at you know max now if your kids are showing a ton of interest and really engage we have had some early learning head start classrooms where the kids played for 30 to 40 minutes with a few of them i think that was in one of the older fours or, or fives classroom but they a handful of kids were just so into it and they just wanted to keep playing so the teacher said all right let's keep this out and keep it going but typically 10 to 15 minutes is plenty we usually do like a circle time activity where we introduce you know the idea of the king let's say and how he moves and we have some kids come up as you know to help demonstrate and then we help set them up on the chess boards where they then get to play with each other and all that takes about 10 to 15 minutes we do do it try to do it daily though because it's all about those frequent small doses of these fun games if you do it just once a week the kids will have fun with it but it's not frequent enough to really help start building those kindergarten readiness skills we're trying to do so three to five times a week 10 to 15 minutes we found is really good and engaging for the kids it's just enough for them to have fun and then want more the next day when you come so you don't want to try to extend it to 40 minutes or an hour where they all become really disengaged paul i, got, I just received a question from rebecca about yeah. do we have any online uh, materials or anything that can help her follow along you know starting on lesson one and moving to today's lesson number three yeah so um, everyone that's on the webinar will katie will be sending out our first 12 units of our lessons to you all so it won't it won't include this activity this activity comes a little later but there are 12 mini lessons where it gets through a lot of the pieces and it, it does the pawn setup race it actually does a whole board setup as well but you'll get the first 12 units of our of the lessons that we teach so it has instructions on how to do it with your with your children or with your students and so at later today or tomorrow at some point katie will send that pdf out to you all we do have online tools as well that's part of our curriculum that we send to teachers uh, for this webinar right now we're just providing those first 12 units if you're really interested in bringing this into your classroom you can reach out to me um, directly at uh, paul.chestforlife.com i'll put it here in the chat and I can, and we, yeah, can, I just talk, we can talk uh, more in depth about what it would look like to bring the program into your school if, if that's what you're interested in doing. Mm -hmm. Also, if you're just interested in getting a chessboard for your home, um, I'll put a URL in here. We, we use Chess House. It's a, it's a you know, chess equipment vendor. And we actually have our own page there, chesshouse.com forward slash chess for life. There's a starter kit on there that's I think 12 bucks and it's it's a big nice vinyl chessboard with letters and numbers around it. Uh, the mm -hmm. big pieces like I'm using here, so it's pretty cheap if you're just looking for a whole at home set to use with your family or your with your kids. If you come into the program with Chess for Life, it's actually funded for the last three years by Boeing, and we we actually provide the materials, training, tools, support uh, all through that grant that Boeing um, gave us. So. Uh, hopefully when we get back here to some normalcy we can start those programs up again because they were having a lot of, kids were having a ton of fun teachers were seeing um, a lot of benefits from the program yeah it's great okay any any other questions so i'm happy to jump into another activity i uh, don't need to if we feel like that was enough uh, what's the sense? We, we, we're going to 145, Katie, is that correct? Yeah, let's do, let's do one more, Paul, and just see, see what okay. the next iteration would be. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here with the, the pawns versus uh, king game, and we'll go into a, a different piece now. So we talked about the king, right, moving one square any direction. So what's really fun about chess is there's six different characters that we get to use. The king is one of them, and he's very simple how he moves the other fun piece that kids would like to uh, learn about is the bishop and the bishop is very unique as a piece um, it moves diagonally only okay so this is a fun one for the kids to to learn how to use and it can move as many squares as it wants on one turn or as few so what's cool about the bishop is it could go all the way across the board in one move and that counts as one turn or you could say well i only want to go one square 
And now you notice, what do you notice about this bishop? What's its restriction? What can't it do if it's only moving diagonal? Does anybody know? Anybody want to take a guess at the chat it? Right. Okay, Michelle, go on a light space. That's right. So this bishop is on a dark colored square. So this is really good for the, the, the three, four, and five-year-olds to, so they have to work within these boundaries of the bishop now. So the king was a little more free roaming. The bishop is restricted to the color square that it starts on. Now in every chess game, you start with two bishops. So you have one bishop on a dark square and you have one bishop on a light square. And so together they cover, they can cover all the squares. But today we'll just focus on one. All right, so the bishop moves diagonally as many squares or as few squares as it wants. And what we do here is we do the same activity that we did with the king. We start with one bishop on the board. We have the kids partner up and we say, all right, so you know how the bishop moves now. We're going to practice it. Let's visit the edge of the chessboard. All right, what edge do we want to go to? Let's visit, let's visit this bottom edge here on the chessboard down here. Okay, great. How many moves, let's see, how many moves it will take to get to this bottom edge? All right, let's take turns. And the kids at first, you know, remembering the king may just move like this. They may try to move like, like a king and say, oh, no, remember, it has to go diagonally and it has to stay on its same color. So then they might go, okay, there's one move. And then the other kid might figure out, oh, wait, I can go as many squares as I want. I can go all the way to the edge in another move. So that only took two turns. And that's great. So once the kids get that, we could visit another edge. And once they start picking it up, they'll realize, oh, I can travel across the whole board in one turn. Now, it depends on the age group you're working with. If you're working with the four-year-olds, the three and fours, they're most likely going to just take a random zigzagging path all across the board. Who knows? It may take them 20 moves to get to the other side of the board. And you know what? That is completely okay. There's no... There's real no right or wrong answer here as long as they're moving the bishop diagonally. And what's beautiful about the game of chess working with these kids is there are boundaries they have to work within, but they also get to be really creative, which I love, right? And it's all about, all right, what path do you want to take? And if they take this wild zigzagging path, but eventually get there, that's great. How many moves did it take? 20? Whoa, that's a lot. Other kids, if they're older, you could challenge them. You could say, all right, you did it in 20. Could you do it in 10 or less and then maybe they'll start figuring out oh I can actually do more moves in one turn so once you do that a few times again just like the king now we add a pawn and the kids can place the pawn anywhere on the board the only restriction here is that it has to be on the same color square as the bishop so if the bishop's on a dark square the pawn has to go to a dark square because if the pawn lands on a light square this bishop will never be able to get it. <laughs> all right, so we can put the pawn on any dark square. And again, now, all right, students, work together, take turns, and move the bishop and see if you can go get that pawn. And again, the, the kids might zigzag their way over there and go capture the pawn. And what's cool about this game is, again, when you have the kids work together, one student may have a plan in their head that they were going to go this way and then this way. But maybe their partner after they move this way, goes one more square down. And so now the student has to re reassess and go, okay, wait, what's my new plan now? And that's what's really cool about these activities. It really challenges the kids to use their brains to think and problem solve together, but they're not really complex problems. So it's age appropriate for them. So when they get the pawn, they can pick up a new one or pick up the pawn and go land on a different square. Once they do that a couple times, now we're going to add a few more pawns to the board. And now it's like, okay, how many turns is it going to take to capture all the pawns? Okay, we can go one, we can go two, three, four, five, six, right? That was a really quick way that an adult or an older student might do it. Again, your kids may take a lot of turns to get there, and that's totally fine. The next level activity that you could introduce, but most of the time that's good enough, is adding more pawns. But every once in a while you have those five-year-olds, maybe they've been playing chess at home, or they just really get it, it just locks in. Well, what you can do now is you can actually give them each their own different color bishop. 
So all of our activities, and this is all in the curriculum, all of our activities have these tiers or these layers to them. And so you always can increase the challenge or decrease the challenge for the students. And so if I have two students that are really getting this, and I've done this in classes that I've taught, they each can get their own color bishop, and they each can place a different color pawn somewhere on the board. And now this is starting to look a little bit more actually like a chess game. Now one mm -hmm. player plays with the dark pieces, the other player plays with the light, and they're trying to go get each other's pawns. And so the light player may move up here, the dark player may move down, and again, they're still taking turns. So they still have to work on that social, emotional, you know, self-control, patience. Um, but now they get to be in control of their own piece. They're not sharing a piece. And okay, they got their other's pawns, and now we can add, you know, a few more pawns. And you can place these anywhere on the board. And now you can see how the activity and the challenge is growing. But again, now they each control their own pawns, taking turns, and they're going to try to capture each other's pawns. Right? So that's the bishop, and all of the pieces follow that same progression. So whether you're teaching the king, the bishop, whether you're teaching, let me find out, the rook, right? So another piece on the chessboard. They all follow the same progression of you start with just one piece on the board, work together, get to an edge, add a pawn, add a few more pawns, and then even potentially add a different color bishop with the opposite color pawns. So this is how we progress through the activities. There's a total of 36 units in our curriculum, a unit we focus on for about a week. So if we were working on the bishop, we would do those few different activities for the bishop. There's actually a big motor movement activities. It's a let's move section where you have actually the kids get up and do hand motions. There's rhymes uh, for the pieces that you can teach the kids. So there's flashcards. And so there's lots of different activities. So you focus on this one unit for a week and then you can move on to the next unit. And so over the weeks, after a whole school year of doing this, I will say that the students will not play a full chess game. So that's how, that's how um, minimal we've made this. So we're not even trying to get the kids to be able to play a full chess game with checkmate. Once they get into kindergarten, that's something that they can learn then. But in our early learning setting, we're really just using this activity uh, to build kindergarten readiness. All right, I see a comment here. The castle guy sounded overwhelming at first, but this is totally doable. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Yes, and uh, your, uh, Michelle, your experience is similar to many other people we work with. They first hear it, they first see it, and they go like, no way, no, 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 no. And then we go through some activities. We do a two to two and a half hour training where I actually go through a lot of the units, and I even go through some of the basics of chess. And when teachers come out of that two to two and a half hours, they're like, I got this. This is so exciting. I can't wait to do it. So, um yeah, it sounds overwhelming at first, chess for three, four, and five-year-olds, but once we break it down to say, oh, it's just a really simple activity, uh, usually people are like, yeah, I can see how this would work. Yeah, I've, okay. seen, I've seen enough classrooms now, Paul, that um, you, you would think, wow, how can they possibly do this? But it's pretty amazing when you see yeah. the kids actually, um, you know, manage it. And and as Paul said, you know, we've talked about the social emotional stuff, but, you know, being able to take turns, that's a big deal um, in preschool, and especially with a lot of the families that we're working with where, you know, they may have some executive functioning issues and other stuff, challenging behaviors and other stuff going on um, in the classroom. And we've seen through this game how that can lessen it. I know that some of the programs that are piloting uh, the early learning chess curriculum have reported to us that they're start they're starting to see that with some kids that they've you know had some um, some challenges with I guess I'll say yeah. <laughs> and trying to and trying to keep them calmer. Yeah, really exciting story that came out of one of the classrooms because the cool thing about chess is that you can there's a lot of um, it's a game of mistakes and loss, right? You're when you're working with lots of people pieces, you're you know you might get a pawn captured, but you have or other pawns, so you don't feel as bad about it. So it helps kind of normalize loss and mistake. And the great thing is with the chess boards, you just reset it up. 
you finish an activity like, all right, I lost that one. All right, let's set it up again and do it again. And so what teachers are finding is kids are able to deal with loss in other areas a little bit better. Like, oh, that's okay. We'll just do it again. So this one student that was notorious for um, really uh, uh, handling losses poorly, you know, he was about to get into a race with uh, his friends and when he loses, it's, it, the day is over. And the teacher was like, oh no i might need to go over there he's about to just race and he's not very fast so he usually loses and he lost the game and he goes that's okay you know or he lost the race he goes that's okay we can just have another one and this student is one of the students that really had been engaging in the chess program and she attributes some of that chess those chess activities and just getting okay with oh i lost a piece that's okay i have another one um so those are the kind of cool stories we're coming that are coming out of this program and it's just been so exciting to to see these three, four, and five-year-olds take take to this game. But uh, so 140, I, I think I'll stop there, but was, I believe we do have another webinar on the books. Katie, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Oh, yes, we have one more. Um, and uh, this one and all the other ones are available online and I'll be conscientious about um, actually sending out the follow-up um, <clears throat> and Paul, if there's any other information that you want to include in a follow-up, just send it my way and we'll send it to the folks who attended here and the ones who registered but didn't attend and the ones from the last group as well. Great. Cool. Great. Yeah, thank you guys for, for joining us. And again, if you, if you uh, express some interest in your program um, adopting this more large scale, feel free to get in touch with me or Paul or Katie yeah. and we'll start we'll start reaching out to your program um, because it is something that uh, it is something that we're able to offer. Um, and we have some funding to, be able to do that. Oh, great. I think that's it. And nice. um, I wish you guys a nice, a nice day. Enjoy. Yeah, yeah you too. Bye everyone. Awesome. Bye everybody. Bye everyone. Bye. Be safe and healthy. Same.